And then, whatever is, uh, is good. A wonderful good afternoon. Welcome back to paradise. Um, some of you may have seen that here in the first two rows it says reserved. It is reserved for you. Yeah? So don't be shy, don't sit in the back. I know it's national holiday, so the room will not be completely full. But those who are here, you are very welcome. Sit in the first two rows because the reserved is reserved for you. We will start in about five minutes. We are waiting for two of the panelists for this most exciting story on the logistics of e-commerce.
Okay, so I think we uh, we stop. Good. And then presentations will be from the podium, right? I think it's yeah better with more. Okay, a wonderful good afternoon. Thank you all for joining this session on the trade logistics of e-commerce. My name is Jan Hoffmann. I am chief of the trade logistics branch at Anktat. Um, I mentioned earlier we have some places here that are reserved. They are reserved for you, so please don't don't be shy. <laughs> um, it's really a, we are quite passionate about this topic. Uh, we love the E in e-commerce, but as you know, you still need some goods crossing borders physically. And there, with new technologies, with global initiatives, with regional and national initiatives, I think we have a very, very rich panel here that will share with you solutions. The idea is to go into a solution. The problems we have heard uh, quite a few about, of course, before you introduce a solution, you have to share a bit like what is this going to solve. So we have structured it a little bit going a bit from the global to the via private sector to national uh, solutions. Uh, not all of the 10 fantastic panelists fit on this podium, so sometime later we will have a little switch. Um, and w one, one last important information for you. When you stand up while speaking, you have 30% more oxygen in your brain. So that's why we just agreed that the panelists, unlike me, you will be standing there while you make your interventions. And um, without further ado, we are co-organizing this uh, UNCTAD with uh, UPU, our, our friends in Bern, both in Switzerland. Um, so unfortunately, the, the initially planned speaker, the director general, he could not make it, but we have Frédéric Omano here, expert Integration Operationnelle du Commerce Electronique. Sorry, let me turn around the card. E-commerce operation integration expert. So let us give one applause to welcome Frédéric and he'll walk over there. Thank you. Less, 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 less. <laughs> and and uh, I was just asked in very, very low voice, how long do I have? <clears throat> because uh, he, he wasn't in the earlier round. No, the intention really is to, to give you time for questions, discussions. So the, the guidance the other speakers are aware of are seven to eight minutes. And, uh, well, we do what we can. Thanks so much, Frederick. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you this afternoon uh, here uh, at this very uh, wonderful event, uh, touching on a very important topic, and that is e-commerce. And some of you could be wondering why the post is here. Uh, so as the moderator introduced myself, my name is Frederick Omamo. I'll stand in for the DG uh, of the UPU who could not make it. Uh, he had some other appointments to engage in. And I'll take you briefly through what the UPU is and what we do uh, for the postal sector as a specialized UN agency focusing on postal matters. And uh, we will see how the post is, uh, is an integral part of the e-commerce equation. Now, uh, just a brief introduction, uh, because we are an intergo intergovernmental uh, agency, I will not do a sales speech, but just for, so for those of you who may not know who UPU is, uh, UPU is a member state organization, intergovernmental, as I said, comprising of 192 member countries. And uh, what we do there is to build and develop uh, standards and regulations that can enable postal items to move across borders. Uh, we will see that uh, in a short while, that uh, the postal network represented by UPU is to the tune of 640,000 physical locations. That is quite extensive. That is the largest distribution network in the world. Uh, the only thing is that each country is unique. What we do is to try to make sure that, that those unique networks are interoperable. Another unique thing about the post is that uh, the services offered by the post are multidimensional. So we have physical services, electronic services, hybrid, and financial services. Uh, the global postal network employs over 5.24 million people. And annually, uh, through the data that we can see at UPU, over 300 billion postal items are exchanged or are moving. 
across uh, borders. Uh, one of uh, eight billion of which are parcels. And this is important because, as, as I will show you later on, you will see that the parcel traffic is uh, increasing, and the mail traffic is reducing. As I mentioned, uh, we develop regulatory framework for the exchange of uh, postal items, so that when you send an item from Timbuktu to Ottawa, it will arrive there safely, and these countries that are handling your items can settle their dues uh, under common rules that can guarantee access to universal postal service to everybody. As you understand, postal service is a universal service. Uh, it has to be provided, this is, is a human right uh, that we have to make sure that the uh, people are accessible to postal services in any location and in every location. That's why uh, I think it was one of the popes who said uh, before that uh, apart from the churches, the post is also in every location. Uh, and I think that is true. In the mountains, in the valleys, close to the rivers, you'll find a post office, uh, no matter how small it is, uh, some of those people who are, who are trading across borders, they only know the post as their location to be able to send something abroad. Uh, so th that is one thing. And we also build standards. Uh, there are a number of standards that we do. Uh, operational standards, technical standards, and messaging standards. Uh, all these will enable the postal network to interoperate uh, properly. In this current cycle, we have a strategic vision, which we call the three I. Inclusion, integration, and innovation. Uh, this came about because the previous two congresses of the UPU, the congresses are the main decision-making organs of the UPU, they both emphasized on the importance of e-commerce. We went through all the countries, all the regions, and all of them mentioned e-commerce as being important. And therefore, this was put in our strategy to ensure that uh, the post, the postal network can adapt to the e-commerce uh, trend. Of course, uh, the figures, I think that various figures from various research uh, bodies, but all of them point to one direction and that is towards the north. That means there's a growth. And whoever comes late into the field will not gain. Uh, the window of opportunity will close for them because e-commerce is growing, and especially cross-border e-commerce is growing at a good rate. In the postal trend, we see, as I said before, uh, the traffic is moving from mail to parcels, small packets. The envelope, the weight, average weight of an envelope is increasing because we allow envelopes up to two kilos, but we see that now the weight of the envelope is moving closer to actually two kilos. That means the, the, the envelopes are carrying goods now. Uh, and we have small packets as well, and we have parcels. So all those point to the fact that uh, low value small items are being shipped through the vast postal network, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, and that points out that uh, uh, the small and medium sized enterprises and citizens are shipping a lot of uh, items uh, through the postal network. This is just uh, a graphic representation of uh, the same message, the fact that at the top, the letters are declining, as we've seen over the years, and at the bottom, the parcels are going up, and that uh, is, is a good pointer that e-commerce is, is, is driving the digital economy at this moment. A bit about Africa, because now we are in Kenya and we are in Africa, Veda's research predicts that uh, cross-border e-commerce will grow at an annual rate of 25% between now and 2020, twice the domestic rate, and it will be worth around 900 billion US dollars by 2020. So although the US, China, and the UK will account for about 60% of that uh, traffic, Africa is the emerging next big thing. And that's why, uh, as you can see from that uh, diagram, we estimate that uh, over 50 billion of e-commerce uh, worth value will be, will be transacted by 2018, that's this year. The population in Africa is also uh, growing in terms of uh, middle class. And this group really requires things that are 
worth the money. They can access them online. The average age in Africa of those going online is 19 years. And Africa is actually a continent of the young people. It's the youth that uh, comprise the bulk. And these people, uh, they are savvy. They know how to look for things. And they are actually driving innovation from their side, from their demand side. Uh, they are actually pushing uh, technology companies, logistics, to innovate and to match up with what they want. Another opportunity in Africa, uh, as I think was mentioned either yesterday or the day before, is the intra-Africa trade. That is trade of items generated in Africa and traded only in Africa, between or amongst countries in Africa. This is still a small figure, it's only 17% of what is produced in Africa is actually traded across other African countries. The small figure represents an opportunity, of course. Uh, compared to 70% in Europe, 54% in America, and 52% in South America, the 17% of trade that is happening in Afri between African countries is a good opportunity. And uh, I think, uh, as was mentioned by uh, either someone from the African Union or uh, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, in March, 44 countries signed the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which can open up that space and enable integration of transport, movement of people, exchanges of currency, and I think that will boost the South-South trade. And the post has to be at the center of that uh, business because the post is entrenched all the way to the village, as I mentioned. Okay. One thing that uh, you can also uh, appreciate about Africa is that it will, not, it will not follow the traditional path of development. We've seen that uh, despite the challenges of infrastructure, uh, the, the youth are actually innovating and leapfrogging those challenges by adopting mobile technologies and uh, trying to access markets through other means. So, in a nutshell, Africa has the greatest opportunity, and the posts in Africa must play a big role. And the UPU recognized that, uh, that uh, e-commerce is growing, but Africa is not well represented in that uh, equation. And therefore, in 2016, after the Istanbul Congress, uh, the UPU initiated a program or a project which is dubbed Ecom at Africa. This initiative was launched to position the postal network with its vast geographic uh, reach as a key enabler and a key facilitator of e-commerce. It aims at establishing an integrated cross-border e-commerce ecosystem provided by postal operators through physical e-commerce hubs and integrated with online e-commerce platforms via a suite of IT standards and tools that we've developed, which means there'll be a physical hub somewhere connecting to a digital hub, which enables especially posts in Africa to be able to sell things that support things that are being sold online. The main components of uh, this, there are two, as you, uh, was mentioned by the moderator, we have the digital part, but items, as we said, still have to move physically. And therefore, the post is focusing mainly on the physical component, and what we are doing under that is what we call operational readiness for e-commerce. We go to a post, a national post, we survey and audit their situation in terms of operational readiness for e-commerce. We advise where they need to improve so that in the next two or three years, they're able to be uh, physically ready because the, 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 the items must move uh, physically. And if the post cannot move those items within the required standard time, then they cannot imagine or dream of uh, going online. And about the digital, com I mean, digital component, we tell them you can actually have your own but this is not a must. 
You can integrate with existing e-commerce players and just ensure to fulfill orders that are made online. Uh, and so that is, uh, those are the main components. And the layers that we, we, we talk about in this initiative, we have the e-shops. We say the e-shops could be postal or third party. These are uh, purely digital platforms. The post can do this in partnerships and to integrate those e-shops with their own backend systems. And then we have the hubs. The hub component, this is where the post can operate a sorting center with a warehouse close to the airport. So the sorting center has automated uh, machines that can sort items fast. At the same time, they have a limited storage for those items that are moving fast so that they don't have to wait for an order. Maybe, for example, in Kenya, if they know a particular item is moving very fast and is coming from a country X or Y, they can already have some limited stock at the airport of those items. And when somebody orders those items online, they just uh, deliver those items within three to five days. And then, of course, the last one is the postal logistics, which is uh, the core competence of the post. They've been, posts have been doing that uh, for a long time, and they are very conversant with how to deliver, how to collect items and to deliver that, and that they can do by themselves. The key focus of this uh, initiative, as I said, operational readiness, supply chain improvement, implementation of IT tools to support with the monitoring data. As you know, e-commerce depends on big data. Without seeing what is coming, knowing where it's coming from, where it's going, it's difficult to actually plan and improve the system. So we do what we call data operational readiness. We, we make sure that the posts are able to capture significant events in the life of an item from the time the item is collected to the time it is delivered. And then the last one is, of course, the e-market platform. So this uh, representation shows you exactly the movement of items at various layers. What needs to be put at the physical layer, what has to match at the digital layer, so that the data is captured and shared with other posts. The data is used internally to manage uh, operations, and to improve uh, the system. And also the data is used to provide customers with tracking events. So we have key events which need to be tracked and captured by all of the posts. And this is shared in a pool, in a data pool, and then displayed uh, or made available to, to end users. So this is a big project because uh, different regions have different capabilities in terms of uh, resources they can put in place. And therefore, we, we go up and we try really as much as we can to ensure that the, postal, the global postal territory operates as one. Uh, as I said, these are 192 different networks which have to interoperate. And they have different standards, different conditions in the countries. Uh, but we try as much as possible to make sure that the minimum events are captured in each country. At the moment, the Ecomat Africa initiative is moving well. Uh, last week, uh, I was in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, we had one week of uh, auditing their system and coming up with recommendations. Uh, we were also in Tunisia uh, last year and also South Africa. Uh, so this just shows you the countries. We selected six countries to do a pilot uh, for this initiative. And uh, those countries listed there are at different stages of implementing the initiative. Apart from the physical presence, we've also, we are telling the post to improve on reliability. And they are, uh, the UPU introduced an index to measure the performance of the post in four key areas. Reliability, relevance, reach, and resilience. Because physical presence alone is not enough. You can be everywhere in the world, but if your service does not meet the requirements of the market, uh, then you cannot really match and uh, be a player uh, in e-commerce. So we are ranking countries now based on this two IPD index, uh, which gives us and gives the countries a good way to compete in a positive way to ensure that uh, their posts are working according to the standards that we've set. 
That will summarize and end uh, my presentation at this point. I hope it was not long. And uh, I, I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. I, I will particularly remember the moving flowchart with all the little bullets. If this was PowerPoint, I want to know how you did it. I love playing with PowerPoint. Uh, so eight billion uh, parcel business, that's quite a big. Some of the things you said reminded me of the time when the paperless office was introduced. When people started, there was uh, now the, the computer. And all of a sudden, the fair price of paper producing companies dropped totally. Because everyone said, now, who needs paper these days? We all know how easy it is to click print <laughs> and kill another tree. So we have produced more paper since the paperless office started. And I think by the same token, the, the post, you were worried that there will be fewer, uh, yeah, uh, less demand for your services, but then the, the parcels came up. So I think that was a very uh, yeah, good, good starting point. Uh, I forgot to mention to the dear friends in, in the room, we have 10 panelists, and I've divided it a little bit, so in order to allow you also time for question discussion, after the first three, we will open the floor for question and discussion. Then there will be another three planned. Then we will again open it. So the first three are a package of UPU, Ankhtar Asikuda, and WCO. So that will be the first package. So if you have a question, suggestion, doubt for Frederick, write it down. Try to remember it for another 14 minutes. <laughs> and uh, then, of course, the next round, we will also have the... Global uh, Express Association, the private sector, who will then contradict everything the UPU just said. <laughs> Shot is fired, so get ready. But okay, we have this first round. Now we have uh, UPU. Thank you very much. Very well presented. So the, the next speaker is my dear friend and colleague uh, Fernando Silis from Asicuda, Anctat. And we have put him as second because we have this very nice collaboration project with the UPU. Uh, Fernando is, is born in Bolivia and has already been 26 years with UNCTAD. Uh, I have a long list of countries he has worked. All of you who have Asikuda may have met Fernando once upon a time. Uh, the single window in Rwanda, I think, uh, was very much uh, benefited a lot from Fernando's time. And he is currently also Asikuda Regional Coordinator for East and Southern Africa. So let's give an applause to Fernando to start. Okay, yes, now. <clears throat> Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction, my dear Jan. Um, mine is uh, very simple. It's to talk about the Asikuda world as a tool to facilitate e-commerce. It is important to know about some figures. Uh, most importantly related to the operations that we have in more than 90 countries using the Asikuda system in the world. About 15 million customs declarations every year. About 50 million transactions every year. About 100,000 uh, 100, trained users in the world. Uh, about uh, 22,000 computers or more being used for the, for the uh, Asikuda system. Um, we have more than 30 years of experience. Asikuda is a, is a custom system. Its, its primary use is, uh, is for, for customs purposes, but in, in the last years, it's, it's been used also for creating uh, single window concepts. Asikuda is, uh, has a platform, and we have building blocks. As in the platform, we have an integrated customs management system. Uh, we have a common repository. We have a single window portal. We have the EDI uh, platform. We have the e-certifications, and we have the performance uh, indicators in, in, uh, in a joint venture with uh, important partners. As uh, building blocks, there are many. 
I want just to focus on the last two on, on, the, on the right part of the, of the screen. It's uh, the IATA integration and the e-post in, uh, in, uh, in a joint venture with the UPU. Why is a Secuda uh, a tool for e-commerce? Well, first of all, because we are using the WCO uh, data model. That makes the system uh, really open to any kind of data interchange because we have uh, um, uh, the uh, harmonization embedded in the system. We have a modular design meant that we have, meaning that we have e-documents and e-procedures. When I started working with Asicuda, it was in 1992. Most of things were done on paper. And the computers were, as uh, somebody said before, in the, in the background, uh, in the back end. And people would like take data from already processed documents. This has changed largely in the, in the last uh, um, 20 years or so. Uh, all our uh, electronic documents have ICT standards in terms of security, in terms of, of format, in terms of uh, data interchange uh, uh, capacities. Um, we have created two important modules recently in the last uh, perhaps uh, five years one is called the Valuation Database, which helps countries um, following GATT uh, Article 7 uh, recommendations. It makes a lot of, uh, it makes easy the work of customs in terms of valuation uh, procedures and in, in, in avoiding too much delays in terms of, of, of uh, checking values. And then we have another one, which is the performance management. It was done based on WCO recommendations. Uh, it was made jointly with the, with the WCO, and it's been implemented in most of our countries, of our Secuda countries. What it allows is the, is the customs management to understand the reasons why delays may be happening in the clearance process. Uh, and it takes all the, all the uh, data, it takes, it's taken from, from the Asicuda processes, from the clearance process. So there's no additional process, but it's, it's basically uh, like a dashboard that helps customs administrations monitor every single thing from the arrival of the goods up till the exit of goods. And now we are trying to enhance this this process by uh, uh, talking to, to partners, like for example IATA, like for example UPU, to understand what is before, and also with, with uh, couriers, to understand what is before and what is after that. So eventually, uh, uh, times can be monitored at any time. We need to, in this, in this e-commerce concept, we need to make sure that data can be interchanged. And uh, sometimes we know that systems cannot be modified because they are closed, because of security, because of many, many uh, other uh, things. So the Asicuda system is open to create specific services, electronic services, like web services, for example, XML, uh, integration and so, that helps two different systems talking without any uh, major problem. Ma major problem. Uh, the e-payment is one of the examples. Uh, we have many versions of e-payment in all around the world, some of them similar, some of them taking other concepts, but the good thing is that Asicuda and the banks are not modifying their systems at any, at any moment. We're just creating the services that allow systems to, to talk. Let me talk to you about IATA integration. Um, we initially think 
a thought of uh, three main principles to create this. One is partnership, second is solution, and third is integration. And we have the best partnership with IAT. Uh, as you know, it's, it's, it's the organization that, that moves more than uh, 240 airlines in the world. The, the, the good thing of it is that they, and since many years ago, they have all the information about manifests, about uh, airway bills, and um, in the past. Uh, this used to be submitted to customs upon arrival of, of, uh, of the aircraft. And then customs would, would start processing manifests. Nowadays, we modified ASICUDA to get the IATA uh, messages and integrate them into the system as, as the manifest. What happens is actually when uh, an aircraft is departing from the country of, of, uh, of departure, last modifications may be made in the IATA system. And that very minute, the ASICUDA system is receiving that information. When the aircraft is landing, ASICUDA already knows what is coming. What is coming for the country, what is coming to be in transit, what is coming to be transshipped. This is a great advantage. And reduction of, of, of uh, clearing times has been, uh, has, has have a great impact on, 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 on this, um, with this implementation. Of course, there's more. We, we, need, we need to work on something else, but I'll, let me tell you about this later on. Integration, what, which is the, 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 the last principle, is that at the moment the, the aircraft lands in, in, the, in, the, in the arriving country, the system has the manifest ready for clearance. So the only part is the, the, the small part, the physical part, that is location of goods, and eventually it's the um, um, confirmation of arrival. Let me talk to you about the UPU, ASICUDA UPU cooperation. There was an agreement signed in December 2015. There was a project agreement signed in 2017. And thank you very much. And there's a pilot being uh, uh, rolled out in, uh, in Gibraltar by this time. It's, they started in August this year. Main project activities is to integrate some messages from the UPU system. My, uh, the person who spoke before me, he mentioned many things about UPU. Something that I would like to un underline is the value added of all these process that is before the, the exportation of, of parcels. There is um, um, a security that is, that is run, uh, a security process that is run over the, the uh, consignments. And this, this uh, concept makes customs in the, in the important country um, uh, able to pre-select consignments, able to understand what is coming, and able to understand what is the risk of, of these uh, consignments to come. The first thing, and all uh, UPU users, all postal uh, users may be uh, familiar with this um, uh, CN22 form. With the introduction of, uh, of this uh, uh, um, joint venture with, uh, with UPU, ASICUDA modifies this, uh, this document and it, it creates the electronic version of it. Having the electronic version is not only copying and pasting the, 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 the data from the paper to, to the system, because it also has, has other possibilities, like for example, attaching documents, uh, um, invoices, uh, uh, even pictures, whatever. And uh, allowing customs to understand what could be the, the risk of, of having these, uh, these parcels arriving in, in, the, in the country. Mm. 
we have two countries. One is the exporting country and one is the uh, uh, importing country. In the exporting country, UPU plays, uh, plays one big role, which is getting all the information from, for customs, analyzing the information for customs, and eventually creating the export declaration for customs. So there's no need for additional paperwork to create the declarations. When the goods arrive in, in, the, in, the, in the arriving country, we have now the IATA uh, uh, integration. That because of that, we know exactly how, how many parcels are coming for postal uh, uh, um, uh, declarations. And then there's a second uh, uh, role that is played by, by UPU because because they were able to get information from the, uh, from the country of exportation, they can reuse that information in the country of importation, minimizing, their, therefore, the, uh, the, um, the necessity of duplicating information. At the end, customs processes and procedures will continue, and uh, uh, final users of, of postal uh, services will be much more happier because they will understand that procedures are faster. Perhaps they will understand that they, they, there will be no additional costs for, for their uh, delivery or, or the, process, the, the process of clearance goods, and so. We have other contributions in, uh, in, in this e-commerce world. Um, as I told you before, the Asikuda world system is basically, was basically designed for customs administration purposes. So it covers from the arrival of goods till the, the exit of goods in customs. But since customs becomes a key part of, of the international trade, um, countries started thinking about implementation of single window, a centric single window, and why not using Asikuda to facilitate the, 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 the entrance, the transit, and the exit of goods? We have a big um, uh, partner in this uh, implementation. It's Trademark East Africa. Uh, so we successfully uh, implemented the three uh, single window projects, one in Rwanda, one in Uganda, and we started the implementation of, of the Burundi single window. More to come. Uh, and uh, thanks to our friends in Trademark, perhaps more countries will, will continue to th th this, uh, this, uh, this road, this path. In Zambia, we have developed a very nice um, system. It's called Mineral Output Statistical Evaluation System. The name was, uh, uh, was um, created by an Norwegian expert. And if you see the first letters, it's, it says Moses. So everybody knows the system as Moses. What does it do? It makes it possible to automate the mining sector in terms of understanding the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, pr the process of adding value to the mineral. So that's why they call it from extraction to exploitation. It lets mining companies to report extraction, to report uh, sales, to report procurement from other companies and other stakeholders in, in, the same, in the same field, in the same line of business, they are able to also report what they are doing. At the end of the day, what we have is that the government knows with a lot of precision and with the possibility of, 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 of uh, using real numbers in, in the system, how much of each mineral is ready to be exported. Then it comes the request of mining companies to, to, for the export permit. And the system allows the government to understand if what mining companies are requesting is actually okay or not. And at the end, this is the last uh, thing they, they did in, in Zambia, they have 
the possibility of of uh, of uh, checking the the contents of the exports. They just trigger one one um, device into the into the mineral, and the the, min the device will give us a, a list of um, of minerals in that uh, in that consignment, and the system will actually compare this list of minerals and the contents with the list that was done in the laboratory long time ago. Now the, the, the government may be able to understand what is being exported. That was a, a nice uh, ex experience in Zambia, and then they are moving. It was made in, in, a, in a fashion, uh, like a single window fashion, and then they are eager to continue these kind of things. Um, thank you for your, your attendance. Thank you for listening to this presentation. Uh, my name is Fernando, and I am the <coughs> Asikuda Regional Coordinator for East and Southern Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fernando. I, I think it's always a pleasure to see how our Asikuda colleagues, it's, it's not just a software, but it's really a, a partner in, in development. Uh, thanks so much. Now, um, all the speakers promised me to speak seven to eight minutes. Uh, it reminds me, uh, you know, that there are three types of people on Earth. All of you, you have heard that there are three different types of people on Earth. Those that can count and those that cannot count. Okay? So the next speaker promised me <laughs> to count. Uh, Oluimo da Silva. Very happy to, to have you here. I see you have a um, degree also in economics and transport management. So I, it's also at UNCTAD, my group, we work on trade facilitation and transport. And I think it's getting more and more together, especially also in, in e-commerce. You have been with the WCO for, for seven years. You have worked in Angola and, and uh, other Southern African countries in, in SADC. So uh, very happy to have you here from the WCO's perspective. And, and I would still also, even though you don't have the power, call, I would still encourage you to, to speak from there mm -hmm. because you have 30% more oxygen in your brain when you stand up. Yes. If, if you feel like, I mean, you want to remain seated, but I, I think I would encourage you to... I think I have, I have actually organized myself. Uh, okay, you yeah. have the notes there. and so, Okay, so we allow uh, our dear friend um, Uluimo to remain seated, if that's yeah. okay with the audience, yes? Okay. Sorry, um, thank, thank you. Good morning, not good morning, sorry, excuse me. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, um, John, you can, uh, you can count with me that I'll try to speak uh, for the time that you have allocated. Um, once again, good morning, uh, the um, um, uh, friends that are here to attend this session. So um, I would like to, uh, to present to you what the WCO have been doing in terms of uh, uh, facilitation. So facilitation for the WCO, it's a, it's a bigger uh, concept, but you know, if, uh, if I have to define it for the sake of this uh, meeting, I would just say that facilitation is about uh, us producing standard in order for the customs administration to actually uh, implement it. But before I go on uh, with the facilitation issues in the context of um, uh, cross-border e-commerce, uh, let's just give you a brief overview of what uh, World Customs Organization is. World Customs Organization is an organization that was created in the year 50s. Uh, the organization is based in Brussels, and currently the organization has 183 uh, members. The last member to, ac to actually join the organization was the um, Republic of, of uh, Suriname. So uh, our members together, they collectively um, uh, represent about 98% of the global trade. So our vision is um, border divide and customs connect. So our mission is to provide leadership guidance and uh, uh, support to the customs administration to actually improve the efficiency and effectiveness. So within this context, bring us to three main um, strengths that our organization has, which is established um, cooperation, 
um, and uh, provide capacity building to our members and uh, develop standards, tools, convention, and so on that actually, once implemented by the customs administration, they can further facilitate trade. So um, with your permission then, I will just give you a little bit uh, 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 overview of what we mean when we say uh, facilitate the trade in the context of uh, uh, cross-border e-commerce. So for us, uh, e-commerce, uh, it's a bit difficult for us to define, but we see it with some uh, elements that one has to consider. So it's a process that initiates online. So it involves the movement of uh, good physical goods moving uh, across border, and it involves electronic payment, and as well, uh, there is a relationship between buyers and uh, sell and seller. So we acknowledge that uh, e-commerce is something uh, that brings opportunity, but also brings challenge. So uh, um, um, we consider e-commerce as uh, f some some futures important within the context of e-commerce. So we are talking about the 24. Um, seven market, we are talking about um, the need to have a competitive price and also efficiency is one important element in, um, in e-commerce. So uh, in the context of e-commerce, we have been doing uh, or work in the trade facilitation for a couple of uh, uh, years since the existence of the organization. But within the e-commerce, uh, we uh, recently, uh, as from 2016, we have actually created one working group dedicated full in e-commerce. So um, we have actually um, managed to have a study report which outlines the, the various position of several member customs administration with regards to the e-commerce. And in this report, the customs administration have actually pointed out what are the challenge with regards to the e-commerce. So it gave a direction or a roadmap for the e-commerce working group that the WCO have uh, actually um, created. So uh, this year, in February, we have organized our first uh, uh, global conference in China, which had more than uh, 2,000 participants. Uh, and uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, tools and instruments related to e-commerce, so I can uh, quote the revised Kyoto Convention, uh, which uh, uh, deals with harmonization and simplification of customs procedure in this convention, you find standards that are also applicable to uh, e-commerce cross-border um, e-commerce cross-border um, situation. So um, the convention also uh, have uh, a standard, for example, that deals with the de minimis and is applicable also to the to the to the e-commerce uh, in the context of e-commerce. So we also apply or promote the trade the trade facilitation agreement of the WTO. And uh, um, I just would like very quickly to um, inform you that very recently we have concluded a guideline that deals with immediate release, uh, immediate release and we also have uh, managed to conclude a resolution that outlines seven principles uh, that are applicable strictly in the context of, uh, of e-commerce. And from this uh, uh, resolution, from the, the, the resolution that I have these seven, um, seven principles, we have, uh, we manage actually to conclude a framework of standard applicable to uh, e-commerce operation, which actually has uh, 15 uh, global standard, uh, emphasizing on things like uh, uh, customs, the need for the customs to introduce the minimus, uh, the need for the customs to uh, expand uh, the concept of authorized economic operator, even to operations of uh, e-commerce, risk management, and uh, uh, also uh, the need for the customs administration to uh, make maximum use of uh, non-intrusive inspection and uh, artificial intelligence, actually, for the sake of um, uh, speed up uh, operation in regard of uh, e-commerce cross-bordering uh, trade. So uh, we still have some work to be done, 
but uh, probably uh, we are envisioning that uh, next year we will do uh, further work. So the idea is that what we produce uh, has to be adopted by the customs administration. And being adopted uh, means that uh, if the customs administration adopts and the customs administration doesn't implement, so the impact in, the, in terms of trade facilitation is lower. So I also would like to, uh, to say that within this context, we also have some, uh, we have MOUs with uh, EPU, we have M MOU with uh, Global, um, global um, Express, uh, uh, with Global Express, we have also with IATA and UNTAD. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oluimo. Uh, Muito uh, obrigado. In, in one of the earlier sessions uh, where, where Anna, uh, I think your director now, she, she also had a discussion on the de minimis. Maybe that's something to, to discuss further. So we would have now five, maximum 10 minutes time for questions, doubts, corrections. Uh, and I see already, uh, yeah, thank you very much. And if you could briefly introduce yourself and then comment or ask your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, my name is Mrs. Job Nogi. I'm a program coordinator in African Alliance for E-Commerce. Um, I would like, uh, first of all, thank you for all presentation. I would like to just uh, uh, ask a question to Mr. Silva and also Mr. Omamo. Uh, my first question is, uh, I don't get to you well. Uh, if uh, WCO has developed a guideline on e cross-border e-commerce. The sec second question is uh, to Mr. Omamo. How you will deal with uh, uh, um, illicit uh, flows? in, in, in uh, tracking, but uh, I saw one of your slide is very interesting, but I would like to know if you integrate uh, some solution in order to track the uh, illicit uh, financial flows. Thank you. You mean illicit financial flows or the, the goods, the financial, illicit financial flows? Okay, thank you. Let us see if we get maybe two more questions. And then the panelists can, can gather. Yes, please. Good afternoon. My name is Shalin Nafila. I'm the Chief Executive of Crystal River Products. I have two questions. One to Mr. Frederick. I'd like to know how advanced the UPU system is. And in case someone would like to start trading, how easy is it for it to use the system or a partner with the UPU. Uh, my second question goes to Mr. Ferdinand. I'd also like to know how hard or easy is it for a startup e-commerce site to partner with Analytica, and what are the integrities involved in the partnership? Thank you. Um, your second question was for whom? The first question was... The, se the second question was for... Mr. Ferdinand. Yeah, Mr. Yes. Fernando. Fernando, okay. sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay, and Fernando got the question? Good. We have a third question, comment, I see. Please wave uh, strongly. Eh? I've, I'm getting old, but I see the, the hand over there, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Unya Bule uh from National Association of Nigerian Traders. Uh, my question goes to the custom uh, rep who just finished his presentation. Uh, because from the entire presentation process, it looks as if a custom is yet to really come to terms with uh, the emerging issue of uh, e-commerce and how to direct it. And so my, my emphasis is that you should explain to us uh, what framework is, is uh, WCO developing in terms of uh, the de minimis uh, threshold, because it's a concern in, in the, within the context of uh, e-commerce. And then, uh, what's customs definition within the context of e-commerce and physical goods? What do we determine? Is it services that is rendered by the e-commerce platforms or the physical goods that 
uh, comes to the port at the point of delivery. Thank you. Thank you very much. And at the very end, okay. Um, I see three hands, and I will close after those three. Sorry, I didn't see the last one. We have to, to move on. We mo so the first row here, please, and then the lady in the back, and then the hand I saw here. Thank you. Um, my name is Machuki. First question is um, uh, to EPU. Uh, of course, also is partly a recommendation. Uh, the kind of systems you are building, and of course that you have uh, at the end of the day the postal corporations, and we are insisting on in intra uh, trade, especially e-commerce, and inter trade within African uh, region. Uh, how? good are we stationed to help governments, especially uh, governments uh, in, in Africa, to c develop a framework on the national addressing system, because that's a major problem on delivery of uh, e-commerce uh, services, and also on legislative framework, because most of the countries uh, perhaps do not even have legislative framework, and of course the national addressing system uh, framework, which is quite uh, important. Uh, two is on a SCUDA uh, question. Uh, there's a single window system and there's a SCUDA system. I'm, I'm trying to really understand how they complement each other or if there's any conflict or how they partner to ensure that all these issues on e-trade, uh, you know, in one second. Okay, thank yeah, thank you for that question. The lady in the back. Thank you very much. I'm Sanya Reed smith a trade lawyer at Third World Network. Uh, Mr. Moderator, you said maybe de minimis is an issue to discuss further, and I wanted to echo the concerns raised by Leg Borsi about de minimis, because I understand this session is about logistics, but of course governments have many goals. For example, they might need to collect revenue for public services, like subsidising life-saving medicines. And at the World Trade Organisation, the US has an e-commerce proposal that all WTO members raise the de minimis, below which things come in tariff-free, um, and, for example, in the US, their de minimis is 800 US dollars. But in Ghana, it's two dollars. So if Ghana has to raise it to 800 US dollars, then that's a lot of stuff that comes in tariff-free. So when one developing country raised their de minimis, they lost so much tariff revenue because the importers cut up the shipments to come below the threshold and the e-commerce packages come in one dress at a time, that they had to lower it again because they lost so much revenue. And of course, we know here that, for example, 24% of Ghana's government revenue comes from tariffs. For Cote d'Ivoire, it's 48%. So it's one thing for an OECD country like the US to raise it, but they only get 1% of their revenue from tariffs, whereas in uh, uh, low-income countries, according to the International Monetary Fund, if they cut, if they lose tariff revenue, at best they make back 35, 30% of that lost tariff revenue, even if they introduce a value-added tax, which of course is 28 countries in Africa. And for middle-income countries, the rest of Africa, except Seychelles, the IMF says at best you make back 45 to 60% of that lost tariff revenue. So while I accept this session is on logistics, governments mm. also have to consider it much more holistically, mm. and not just the impact on lost tariff revenue, but also how much more imports would come in if the Less, everything less than $800 comes in tariff-free, including things like tobacco and alcohol. The Ministry of Health might have something to say about that because of the impact on their tobacco and alcohol control policies mm. if 800 US dollars of cigarettes comes in tax-free. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. No, and the question is admitted. <laughs> it is definitely of concern because this has a big impact on, on where certain trade physician measures and, and controls start to bite. I had seen one finger here. If The next one I see is... Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, the, the dark blue, uh, Monsieur, oui. C'était vous qui voulez poser une question. Pardon. And, Merci and, and de m'accorder la parole. Thank you very much. My question is to the uh, member of UPU. Have you taken into account the costs? Costs that to me appear high, especially for small businesses or for uh, small and medium enterprises because uh, sending a, a parcel by post office is more expensive than the traditional uh, means used by small business people uh, because of the issues of customs. The second aspect on UPU, does your system take into account the issue of uh, returned parcels because sometimes uh, the goods sent are not sold as such uh, or accepted by the client 
and therefore this issue of managing parcels that are returned to the sender, are they taken into account by the country or by the demands by the client? That's my question. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I know there are a few other questions, but we are already eating into the time of, of the next round. So, um, we had a fascinating question on, on guidelines, illicit financial flows, how easy to use is a UPU system. Fernando had a question that I did not understand, but he said he understood. Uh, Nigeria asked about uh, WCO. Uh, Asikura. And then there was a question, of course, on single, uh, on single window and, and Asikuda. Uh, the, the challenge of services, uh, when does a service become a good? No, you, you s s transmit something, and 3D printing, that type of thing. Uh, how would the UPU help governments? Also the costs of postal. Was, and then, of course, this big discussion on de minimis, which uh, I think is a valid question. I, I would like to ask the three panelists that have spoken to really make very brief comments on where you feel you can say something and, and then we move to the next round. So I go by the same sequence as before, Frederick, Fernando, and then Oluimo. Please. All right, uh, thank you for those questions. Uh, I, I'll try to answer them as best as I can uh, if I recall uh, most of them. Uh, but I know that there was a question about uh, uh, controlling anti-money laundry uh, in the financial flow, though I didn't talk about it. But uh, the postal network uh, represents, is the second largest uh, financial service provider offering uh, bank accounts and access to the financial network to 1.5 billion people uh, across the world who would otherwise not have access to these uh, financial uh, services. Having said that, uh, the UPU has developed a, syst a system, a tool, to help uh, member countries uh, to be able to s provide uh, money order transactions and other means of uh, transferring money electronically. And it makes it easier to actually implement the AM AML by checking, first of all, on the amount that someone is sending out, and the frequency of uh, this person, how much they're sending per day. Uh, just like what uh, MPESA has managed to do here locally uh, by putting limits uh, on the amount of transactions that can be done by one person. So those are the simple steps uh, that uh, can be done uh, to detect any illegal uh, flows uh, in terms of the money. I thought your question was more on dangerous uh, illicit flows of uh, parcels, but financial also is fine. The next one was uh, uh, how to motivate, uh, or how, how advanced is, is the UPU initiative and uh, how someone can partner with the UPU. Uh, the initiative is just uh, two years old now. Uh, we launched it through the government, and uh, from the government we then access the post. And through the government we have to discuss policy issues. Uh, we have to discuss operational issues with the, with the post and also the, the digital layer issues with partners of the post, including uh, the likes of Jumia and the rest. Uh, so the countries are at different stages. Uh, Tunisia is already uh, quite advanced. We developed uh, what we call application programming interfaces to support the integration of uh, uh, the e-commerce markets with postal tools that can assist people to actually buy online. Uh, for partnerships, we encourage the government itself to develop a framework for PPP uh, because we don't come into the domestic jurisdiction. I mean, uh, like for, uh, each country has its own legal framework for putting in place PPPs. What we do as UPU is just to come with best, best practices and to advise the government how to structure these PPPs. But eventually, each government has to come up with a framework and this is uh, normally even outside the, the post. It's, it's the Ministry of Commerce or Ministry of Trade uh, that leads these initiatives. Uh, there was a question about uh, how to help governments uh, to develop a framework on national addressing systems uh, and, and the legal framework uh, to be able to operate well in, in e-commerce. Yes, addressing is important. Quality addressing means you can actually deliver. 
And uh, for UPU and especially for Africa, we see that uh, uh, there was this mushrooming of uh, uh, real estate, uh, and sometimes it's not easy to really locate um, items or uh, units. What the UPU does, we, we have developed a standard called S42, uh, which we, we, we provide assistance uh, in terms of the postcodes and rolling out uh, a, a, an addressing system. We support countries that would like to launch uh, bids uh, in terms of the specifications that are required to put in place such solutions. Eventually, there are some adaptations. Uh, because as you see, uh, we've seen in Kenya, for example, items coming from other countries uh, are addressed only to a recipient with a name, like Frederick Omamo, my city and postcode closest to me. So if it is GPO, it is 00100. And then my phone number. So this kind of uh, addressing will not follow the standard that uh, has been developed before. So the UPU is adapting to each national uh, environment and providing the best advice. Like uh, recently, Kenya uh, launched an addressing tender and uh, we, we provided some support uh, to, to the government to try to provide uh, the specifications for that. And for the last one, uh, which I'll talk about, uh, is the legal framework. We work closely with the ITU and UNCTAD uh, in supporting countries to develop the legal framework for e-commerce because we focus mainly on the postal side. Uh, but on the e-commerce legal framework, ITU and UNCTAD are providing us with a lot of support. They do country assessments. And uh, there's a project we did with, uh, with UNCTAD uh, in Egypt uh, to support them in building a national uh, e-commerce policy and uh, legal framework. Uh, so we do that, but through our partners uh, at the international level. Uh, the last one about the cost of transmitting items. Sorry. Uh, that, that has to be managed uh, domestically. Uh, because if it is uh, international exchanges, there's a, a set of uh, limits that we have already defined. But these are also being uh, put on the table. Uh, as you know, there's been discussions about the rates that we put up there. And with this uh, globalization and uh, you know, many changes are happening, every everything has now been put back uh, and uh, are being discussed afresh so that these things are made more, av uh, more affordable uh, to people both locally and cross-border. So in a nutshell, uh, those are uh, what I can say uh, quickly. Uh, but uh, in case uh, someone needs further information, uh, I will leave my contacts behind, and uh, you can reach us, and we can exchange further. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Fernando? Thank you. Um, partnership, right? Okay, um, briefly. UNCTAD has just released a new guidelines for partnership, and will be, this will be put online if it's not yet there, and you, will follow, you can follow it case by case and, and, and process by process. But the partnership I spoke about uh, during my presentation was pretty much like a natural partnership. Uh, who would be able to deal with, uh, with the air transportation manifests better than IATA? So it was natural. Who would be the best uh, um, um, say partner uh, developing uh, um, um, a measurement of 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 uh, of, um, of uh, activities, it would be uh, WCO, and we followed most of the WCO uh, um, considerations on that. Finally, who would be the best partner to develop uh, postal services? It would be UPU. Now, having said that, uh, we are also interested in having the uh, the, the private sector like, for example, DHL or other uh, couriers to uh, create the perfect environment to allow faster um, deliveries, to allow uh, easier procedures. And um, it, I, I hope I, 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 I um, answered your question. On the, uh, the uh, person from Nigeria talking about Asikuda and single window. Asikuda is, as I said, is, the, uh, uh, is a system that was designed to cover all operations in, in customs. If you read the, the concepts of single window, there's a part of it saying that customs is the natural gateway 
because it allows imports, controls allows imports, it allows controls exports, and it works with transits. Um, that's why in our countries where, where we have a CICUDA, they uh, requested to implement an ASICUDA, a, a single window system based on the same concepts and based on the, on the uh, technology that we have and based on the, perhaps the, the capacity of design that we want, BPR, uh, SRS, all this, all this uh, technical stuff. So um, I'm not saying that a ASICUDA world is, is single window. I'm not saying that single window is a ASICUDA world. But what I'm saying is that both have to interact. And I can say uh, uh, we, we have a nice project also with the WCO uh, funded by, by UK. We, we do a lot of things together. And I know that WCO, not because we suggested, but, but you chose to fly in uh, delegates, uh, customs experts from a number of other countries to Uganda and to Rwanda as a good case. And these are Asikuda single winded. So I, I support this little Ankratse pitch here. Uh, Okay, yes, Olu Imo, your thoughts on the questions. Uh, thank you. I've got about three questions. One of the questions was um, uh, a little bit more if it's a guideline or, or, or if it's what, um, what the WCO has as a unique tool to deal with, um, with um, e-commerce cross-border um, consignment. So I would like to just uh, ratify that it's not a guideline, but it's rather a framework of standards. So it's a little bit deeper than what a guideline is. And this uh, framework of standard has 15 standards based on all the, the, the seven principles which I have just made, uh, which I just um, made the reference when I was uh, making my presentation covering aspect on facilitation and simplification, security, revenue model, partnership, the need of partnership and the need of uh, uh, public awareness and uh, outreach and capacity building. So uh, the idea of this um, framework of standard is actually to uh, shape up the customs policy in respect of, uh, of e-commerce. So, so to say to improve the efficiency of customs administration around around the world when it comes to the time of uh, e-commerce uh, cross-border um, uh, consignment. So uh, there was a question in respect of, uh, I will start with a, with a question on, the, on the, what we mean by, uh, by e-commerce. Are we talking about uh, goods? Are we talking about uh, software? So I would say that so, or, uh, another aspect that I would bring, or are we talking about service? So from the customs perspective, when we talk about uh, uh, e-commerce, uh, cross-border e-commerce, we are just referring to the physical movement of goods. But uh, often when we refer to goods, because goods normally are moved by the means of transport and by, uh, uh, by people, of course, we also have actions with regards to people and the means of transport. Now, in relation to the, to the question that uh, was raised on the issue of de minimis, uh, I would like to say that the de minimis, uh, it is a, a transitional standard outlined in the revised Kyoto Convention on, the, on chapter, chapter 4 related to duties and, uh, and the tax where the convention actually um, specify that customs administration shall uh, make, um, shall refer to minimum value, uh, minimum value or minimum amount of duty and tax that customs should not uh, uh, collect uh, duties and tax. So the idea of this is to dissuade the customs administration to collect revenue with regards to uh, transactions, so to say, that have a very low uh, value. So for some countries, this is something very difficult for the WCO and for, for the members to reach at the common uh, point because uh, I, I heard somebody making comment in respect of uh, some countries uh, were facing uh, leakage in terms of revenue. Yes, this is true, and that's why the WCO finds it 
very sensitive matter and allow the custom, each customs administration or country to uh, determine their own uh, level of de minimis. Uh, if you look, for example, I heard that uh, the US, the de minimis threshold is about 800. $800, but you go uh, to other regional economics community where you find that the, the minimum threshold is uh, 20, 20 euros. So it's something very difficult for the WCO and the members to uh, reach to uh, a consensus, but we have been discussing all along on this. And I just would like to, to highlight that uh, the fact that we have this standard in, uh, in many, uh, or the spirit of this standard in, in some of our tools and instruments, including the revised Kyoto Convention, it doesn't mean that the customs administrations, all the customs administration have this uh, provision in their national legislation because uh, the revised Kyoto Convention, we have 182 three member customs administration, but uh, in terms of, uh, we have 183 members customs administration, but in terms of uh, countries that have acceded to the revised Kyoto Convention, we only have 100 and, uh, 116. So it means that the rest probably are not even following the de minimis uh, policy that the WCO uh, advocate. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, and your moderator has to apologize because we are, we are eating until the time of the next one, but I, I think it was really all very valid questions, and we even tried to give some, some answers on the, on the de minimis, but it's a long discussion. So the next round of presenters, it's again three presenters. We have Vanessa During from uh, the private sector, Globe Express Association. We have Get Natalia from IATA, and we have also uh, Evariste still here. Uh, not sure <laughs> if your director is, is on, his, on his way. He might come, but we have, in any case, we are very happy to have the EAC secretariat here. So, uh, dear three, try to be as brief as possible, and I may be able to allow only very few, uh, um, very few questions, maybe only one afterwards. So, um, Vanessa, uh, you, you have worked on technology and logistics. Uh, you're currently in charge, you're head of, of multinational customers and e-commerce at DHL, and you uh, kindly agreed to get up because that gets 30% more oxygen in, into, into the brain. So you have the floor. Vanessa, thank you for joining us. There we go. So good afternoon, everyone. At uh, 4.30 in the afternoon, I need at least 30% more oxygen uh, in my brain. I think it's important for me to manage some expectations um, before I get started. And the first is, when Jan did the initial introduction, he implied that there may be some conflict between the UPU and the Global Express Association. I regret to inform you there will be no drama here this afternoon. Yeah, I, I, I can see him actively encouraging it, um, but quite honestly, as the Global Express Association, we are very, very confident that there is opportunity for all stakeholders to play a role in supporting the growth of e-commerce, not just in sub-Saharan Africa, but certainly across the world. So it's a real pleasure for me to speak on behalf of um, the Global Express Association. And just to give you some context to it, it's brands that you might well be familiar with um, in the form of FedEx or Federal Express, UPS and DHL. It's fortuitous that we're having this discussion now because as, as an organization, as an express logistics um, or express courier, we're not a very old business or a very old industry. Um, the, the oldest company that is part of the, the, the Global Express Association is a little over 100 years old, and that's UPS. For FedEx and DHL, um, we're, we're, we're still relatively young. Um, in that we were, both, we were both established in the 70s. So next year for DHL is a big year because we celebrate half a century of existence. And over the years, there has certainly been some really interesting developments that no doubt had us worried. So things like telex, 
the very scary and evil fax machine certainly would be the death knell um, of the courier industry. And yet, somehow, we were able to, um, to evolve um, and embrace the concept of dutable consignments. And, and that really can only be done um, by a number of stakeholders evolving, including customs authorities, to allow us to carry dutable consignments. The net result is that the, the e-commerce revolution, so to speak, is forcing us to reinvent and reinvigorate ourselves in a really positive way. And certainly not within the same time frame as we may have responded to the fax machine for argument's sake. It's much, much quicker than that. And within our business, we often talk about the concept of building it and flying it at the same time because we're having to respond really in a very agile way to what customs require of us but more importantly, what customers require of us in terms of the e-commerce delivery experience. Um, and so as a result of this evolution, where DHL's business, for example, has changed, is we've historically been built as a business-to-business -business service provider um, carrying documents and parcels cross-border. Um, we focus on eight sectors, so it's traditional sectors that you would identify with, like the energy or oil and gas sector, technology, financial services. Um, we're now in a position in 2018 where the e-commerce sector is our fastest growing sector out of all of them and is a little over 20% of our global volume. So, so please don't for a moment, don't think that we, um, we take for granted the fact that we've got to invest a huge amount of effort and energy to make sure that we understand what's needed and that we're responding accordingly. So what we find in speaking to customers is that there are some absolute real as well as perceived barriers to entry. Um, the most common barriers that customers will share with us is firstly, what is the rest of the world like and what does it involve to send something outside of my city and my country? The second um, biggest barrier that we find is related to the scary thing called customs. So what is, what is duties and what is taxes? What are prohibited commodities and what are restricted commodities? And the fact that I as an entrepreneur definitely don't want to get in trouble um, by upsetting customs anywhere. And the third is payments. Um, and so what is involved in payments? How do I receive it? What do I do with the money once I have it? So, so those are some of the real, um, the real barriers. Fortunately, Today I'd like to focus on really more some of the innovations that we've, um, that we've adopted to overcome some of the, the more obvious challenges um, that were experienced in the rest of the world and to a, large experience, to a large extent are experienced here. And that's probably the best opportunity presented by forums like this, as well as being part of an international organization, is that we get to exchange experiences and information to fast track and to, to lend from Frederick's comment to leapfrog some of the challenges that, um, that are faced in the rest of the world. So a couple of key innovations to talk about, and perhaps not so much innovations, but um, changes in processes that we've embraced is from a regulatory and compliance point of view, the ability to exchange data with customs is an absolute non-negotiable. It's very, very important for us um, in working through the concept of pre-clearance, which speaks to a better customer experience as far as delivery is concerned. And of course, it, it translates into a rather cliched win-win scenario in that the better we are at sharing data with customs, the quicker the release will come, so customs will achieve their objective in terms of collecting revenue, um, and the faster we will get the release to go and execute on the delivery. And that's a really big deal as far as e-commerce is concerned, because the faster we clear, the faster we deliver, the better the customer experience, and the more likely they are to repeat that same transaction. Um, the, the, the concept of de minimis has been raised a number of times, and we could probably have an entire session um, related to, to de minimis. There's very much a mixed sentiment around the world, um, with even places like Australia challenging um, what, what the de minimis involves and, and what sort of charges are levied between duty and, and GST. Um, as an organization, DHL continues, um, and certainly the Global Express Association, continues to advocate um, for, the, for the adoption, firstly, of a de minimis um, and for the raising of a de minimis. And quite simply because 
Um, the customer, as a lay person, ordering books, um, handbag, clothing, etc., online, um, has an expectation that the minute they make payment for those goods, they should realistically be able to receive them in just a few days' time. They are less concerned with the fact that, yes, it may have arrived within a day and a half or two days, but then takes a further three to five days for customs clearance. And so their overall experience is somewhat tainted by the fact that, for them, delivery was a long time, and yet they've paid for a short delivery experience. So there's a vested interest on, on, on both parts um, for us to expedite or to utilize the de minimis to get an expedited delivery. I speak a lot about the customer experience, but that's because we know that based on the different generations that have embraced e-commerce, there's very different behaviors that play out. So what we know, although it sounds very ageist, but the, the millennials are very demanding, um, and it's all about instant gratification, which for us, from an express point of view, speaks to how we're wired and what is part of our DNA. But... Um, but the reality is that we then need to invest quite significantly in how we translate that expectation on instant gratification. So one of the innovations that we've applied um, globally, and specifically here in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's interesting because it speaks to some of the challenges around the addressing system. So just as a matter of interest, as the UPU may have some challenges, so does DHL. So much so that from a productivity point of view, one of the KPIs that we, we measure as an organization is literally the number of deliveries or collections that our couriers make in any particular hour. In sub-Saharan Africa, there are some countries that are 30% worse from a productivity point of view, than our European counterparts. And that's quite simply because they're looking for a collection at the third house on the left behind the, cold, the, the old convent building, and that's a legitimate address. So some, some real challenges that need to be navigated as far as, um, as addressing system is concerned. So the innovation um, that this speaks to is something called on-demand delivery, and it supports inbound deliveries for customers, which effectively is an interface that when the customer's consignment is dispatched, their mobile number is utilized to notify them that their parcel is on the way. And it gives them an expected date of delivery and obviously the location. They then have an option to click on a hyperlink that takes them to a portal that says, actually, I would much prefer for my delivery to take place a day later and between 8 and 12 um, in the afternoon. And, and that makes for one, an element of flexibility and convenience, but certainly greater efficiency because the customer then receives the consignment when it suits them rather than when it suits us as a service provider. Um, interestingly, 88% of customers would prefer delivery to take place at their home, um, which is also quite unexpected because if we think we've got uh, struggles with address quality in major um, urban areas or, or business centres, you can imagine what residential areas um, could entail. What, what's also uh, very important to note is that uh, the, the research within the industry, and it's not specific to, to express um, as a sector, is that given the option, 39% of customers would actually rather go to what we call a PUDO, which is a pickup or drop-off location. So they will collect when it's convenient for them. So for argument's sake, um, if I'm stopping at the filling station to put in petrol this evening, I'll collect my parcel at 11 o'clock. And so how we've been able to respond in that instance to, to support the last mile delivery experience is to actually put down what we call parcel lockers or swip boxes. And if you imagine it, it's really just a bank of lockers that the customer gets a unique code, they punch that in and the drawer opens and they can collect their consignment. Um, so massive, massive adoption um, that we're finding. In some places, for example in Accra, um, we've got one parcel locker with 100 drawers and we turn that, par that parcel locker over three times a day. So literally 300 shipments are processed through that particular facility. 24-7 because the customers are able to access it at their convenience. Um, just two last points, if I may, is around the traditional pain points that do relate to duties and taxes. And it needs to be said that as a Global Express Association, we are not anti 
duties and taxes. We absolutely get it. Uh, we make a lot of effort to understand what's required from us in order to comply with customs expectation and, and the revenue objectives of countries. Um, but w where we see the opportunity is to make that a less painful process. So we're able to support two scenarios. When customers send consignments with us, they have the option for their customer to pay the customs charges or for us to support them to collect those charges in advance. Um, and, and that speaks, again, to a better customer experience. It places a huge burden on us in terms of having to understand that a handbag sent to France will attract 8% duty and 12% VAT, for instance. Um, but that's part of the consultative process that we use when we are eng engaging entrepreneurs, is to say to them, we have access through, you know, to, to this information through our global network. Let us help you to navigate that uh, far more effectively than you may do um, on your own. So advanced duty collection and um, duties and taxes paid is, is, a big, uh, is a big focus for us. So many challenges, but you can see this is just a, a small example um, of when we come together with stakeholders, particularly with customs, um, with colleagues from the rest of the world, and talking to customers, we're, we're able to innovate quickly, and we're able to scale those solutions to, to make a meaningful impact. And so our ability to collaborate really speaks to our biggest priority, and that's the expectation, is that the, a rising tide will raise all boats. Um, and so, again, just to reinforce the message that there is a place for everyone, um, and, if, and if nothing else, it's hugely complementary of each other. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. And I was trying to tickle some, but <laughs> we are all footing in the same direction. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I, I would like to highlight the point you made. The, a lot of the solutions require the exchange of data. That is something we had in several earlier sessions, also on maritime logistics. Uh, there are many new possibilities to exchange data. We, we talk about blockchain, we talk about Internet of Things, we talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, many things that, possibilities that require, are based on exchange of data. Uh, thanks so much. Um, next speaker is Gatnet Taye from uh, IATA, Regional Manager, Cargo Africa at, at, at International Air Transport Association. Uh, before IATA, you worked in the airlines industry, and the floor is yours. Get that, please. Let's Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm supposed to have a presentation. <laughs> Okay, my name is Getnet uh, Tai. Uh, I work for IATA uh, in charge of the sub Sahara region uh, for cargo. Uh, let me start by uh, briefly uh, explaining what IATA is. IATA stands for International Air Transport Association. Uh, it's a global trade association for world airlines and it was founded in uh, 1945 uh, by 57 airlines. And currently, we represent uh, 287 passenger and cargo airlines, which is 84% of the global uh, traffic. And we support uh, many areas of aviation activity, and we help uh, to formulate uh, industry policy on critical uh, aviation issue. Uh, just to discuss a little bit about our industry, which is air cargo. Uh, it represents less than 1% of the total uh, cargo volume transported globally, but uh, when it comes to uh, value, uh, it represents uh, more than 35%, which is equivalent to $5.5 trillion. A typical one day in air cargo looks like this. Uh, we have we transport uh, 600 57 million parcels. Uh, and uh, more than 200 uh, horses and uh, 
sorry. <laughs> and more than one million uh, cell phones. Uh, 340 billion letters and 6.7 billion postal parcels are transported annually. Uh, airmail represents only 3% of the, the cargo business for, for the industry. Uh, however, with the growth of e-commerce activity, a, sing a significant expansion is anticipated. To, over to overcome the challenge, the airmail industry will face uh, IATA strengthen its cooperation with uh, postal authorities, especially with UPU, and develop standard and procedure uh, concerning the handling of uh, Males. There is a significant growth in e-commerce uh, industry. Just if we see one of the big global player, Alibaba, uh, they have experienced uh, uh, more than 54% growth, uh, single-day growth in 2015 compared to 2014. And as it was mentioned earlier by uh, my colleague from UPU, uh, the industry is exp experiencing a decline in uh, letter and uh, postcard business, but this is getting offset by uh, the increase in uh, small parcels and packets. Postal operators and airlines have to redefine their models and cope with a new set of operational challenge. So for that reason, we are closely working with uh, with UPU, and we have also uh, our own uh, airmail uh, board, which is currently making a gap analysis between the business process of uh, the, the airmail and the business process of uh, e-commerce. And this board uh, and the cargo transformation team will look into the service that will be required to develop uh, the new standard that will, that will arise. So these are the challenges of our industry. Uh, one of the challenges is uh, trade war, uh, infrastructure investment, border management and efficiency, uh, specialized supply chain, safety and security is another concern, and industry, industry uh, digitization. And for, to support these, to cope up with this challenge, IATA came up with this program. It's called uh, Simplifying the Business. And we... Uh, it had these uh, this six goals uh, to make the air cargo industry uh, easier, smarter, and faster. So under the Simplifying the Business uh, project, we have uh, these portfolio projects. Uh, the first one, which I'm sure uh, many, of, uh, man, many of you are familiar with, is E-Freight and e Airwheel project. This is about getting uh, the paper document out of the cargo supply chain. The other one is one record. Uh, this is creating a single digital record for, for a shipment, which will be owned by a data owner. It can be airline or a shipper. Then it will be the data will be accessed on a need to know base. Uh, interactive cargo. This one is all about making the, the, the cargo talk. Uh, what we know is cargo doesn't talk, so whatever happened to cargo, it will just uh, go silent, but now uh, cargo is going to send real-time tracking data to, to the shippers. So if there's any inconveniency uh, or any discrepancy uh, throughout the supply chain, then uh, the, the, sh the shipper or the customer will get uh, the message. And we have also other uh, programs on facility modernization, uh, on uh, database uh, collection, and also uh, uh, on... Uh, cargo community systems. So let's see uh, how the shipment journey looks like uh, today, uh, because this has a very uh, close relationship with the last mile delivery. In average today, uh, uh, an air cargo takes uh, six days to be delivered at the consignee point, and five uh, days out of these six days are spent for the cargo to, uh, waiting to be, to be moved or to be uplifted. It, it takes only less than a day uh, for a cargo to fly from origin to destination. So we need to improve the process. And uh, we did a study and we found out this result. Uh, 
these are uh, the, the ones highlighted with yellow and red are the areas that are uh, consuming a lot of time at the, in, the, in the supply chain. So if we see, for example, at origin where the cargo or uh, postal parcel is going to be picked, it will take up to 1.5 days uh, to be loaded on the aircraft. And if, you, if we see the destination, uh, it takes up to three days to clear that shipment out of the warehouse at destination. So we need to, pro to improve this uh, to minimize the time uh, spent for, for transporting the air cargo. Uh, for this, we need to, the industry has to be supported by, uh, by the government and authorities. Uh, we basically uh, engage authorities, uh, including our partners like, like WCO, to uh, first countries to, to, to ratify the international treaties. Uh, these treaties are uh, the, uh, Montreal, mainly the uh, two treaties, uh, Montreal Convention 1999 and uh, Montreal Protocol uh, 2004. Uh, these treaties support the replacement of paper documents by electronic document. So the first step to digitize the processes, uh, countries uh, to, to, to ratify the treaties then we start uh, the work. So in Africa, we do a lot of work. Once a country ratifies the treaties, that's a green light to start our engagement with the authorities. So uh, we, uh, even with, uh, if we see the, with the SAI, the Advanced Cargo Information, we have been helping countries in 2018 alone. Uh, we have hel helped like, uh, five countries in Africa to successfully implement Advanced Cargo Information. So the other two are the WCO uh, uh, Kyoto uh, Convention and uh, the World Trade Organization Trade Facilitation Agreement. So countries have to also uh, sign and implement uh, these uh, international treaties. So that's it uh, for me. So if you have any question, I'll be available to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Um, our next speaker is Evariste, a long-standing partner from the AC. He just said he might have a presentation. I don't want to, to cut, cut you off, but I, I think uh, we have seen the, the discussion, the engagement. So Evariste, um, we, we work a lot in the EAC. Uh, in fact, tomorrow we have a, a ministerial, uh, trade ministers. Uh, we have a declaration, uh, a ministerial declaration on trade station. We will launch a regional trade station index. We will um, sign a, a sort of new agreement with EAC and Trademark to continue our cooperation. So very happy to have Evariste here. And if it's okay with you, you, you stand. You have the 30% extra energy and, and speak from, from the podium, if that's fine with you. Thank you very much. Let's give applause to Evariste. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, as you know, ESC, East African Community, is at the level of monetary union. We passed a stage from customs union, common market, now we are forming the, the monetary union. People are working to make a central bank and use a single currency. In terms of logistics, we have two corridors. We have Mombasa uh, to, to Kigali, Rwanda and Burundi through Uganda, and the central corridor from Dar es Salaam to, to Burundi, Rwanda, and, uh, and Uganda. I mean with the, uh, even South Sudan. Uh, only two countries are not run rocket. A four are landlocked, but they are landlocked, but they are op open in a space. Every country has an international airport, and uh, we have ports, Mombasa and Dar es Salaam, but uh, East Africa is developing other ports. There is Ramu in Kenya, Tanga uh, in Tanzania, Bagamoyo, and Mutwara. Uh, we have a good legal framework for sustaining e-commerce. Also, 
in every country there is a post, there is a presence of DHL, FedEx, and UPS for Korea. As you remember, a post used to be a big institution for us who are old. When you are dating, you have to give an appointment to the post. Is where there was a fax and uh, near where you can meet your, your girlfriend or boyfriend. You young people, you are using WhatsApp, Instagram, and, and so forth. This is in the, in internet. Is in East Africa, there is internet. We are connected to a fiber optic, and we are using satellites. But the institutions we visited, the assessment we made, at the borders, the customs, and the other institutions, there is a problem of connectivity. Sometimes the systems are down, uh, the server, some, some countries are obsolete. That is where our the policy makers be there for orient money to invest in uh, this technology. There is something unique in East Africa. We call it a single custom territory. A single custom territory is where you can uh, clear uh, and pay your goods where they are still at the, the harbor, the, the Mombasa port and the Dar es Salaam. Then you clear at the destination, you pay the goods they cross the borders without uh, checking. Uh, they have electronic uh, cargo tracking, then can monitor where you are, the movement of goods. That reduced tremendously the cost of doing business and increased the revenue of these countries. Trade facilitation and easy logistics is for the government a benefit in the increased rev uh, revenue and business, they, 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 they decrease costs. We have other enablers. We have a process in our registrations for processing pre-arrival. Pre but this is not used fully. Business people, they are not aware, and customers, they are still rigid. They are still using their traditional way of uh, doing things. Uh, there are no tariff barriers in East Africa, but there is a fight to reduce them. There, is a, there are debates or levels of decision-making process to reduce non-tariff barriers. Every country has a single window. It means all institutions of government who approve the clearance are on one, one uh, uh, platform. We have a program of AO, Authorized Economic Operators in East Africa, a regional program. We have uh, many companies approved across. There are, we, uh, we develop the, the identifier in the system or a physical identifier on the track. When AEO pass, you salute, it goes to uh, his premises. We have trade portal information, the trade information portals in every country. We are developing in every country. We have launched the Kenya, uh, Rwanda, and Uganda. Now this month we are launching in Tanzania. We are developing Burundi. We are, uh, we are also uh, mobilizing resources for South Sudan. We have major borders are 24. They work 24 hours, uh, seven days. And we harmonized uh, time at the border, major borders and airports and ports. This, for sure, they reduce costs of doing business. Uh, also, we have other enablers instruments. Oh, sorry. We are using uh, uh, HS code is an instrument of uh, trade uh, world customers organization that we have we are we transpose it every year every no every five years now we are using the 27 version uh, also we have in east africa we have one registration customs registration is called East African Customs Management Act, which is in the review. Also, that, that, that tariff is under review. 
Also, the rules of origin. The rules of origin are automated. We have e certificates of origin. And also, we have a simplified, simplified uh, trade regime for SMEs. Also, uh, the potential, we, we work closely with the private sector, uh, the industry, the East African Business Council, the businessman, uh, the businessmen, and uh, uh, the Clear uh, Engagements Association of East Africa. Also, we, have, we work with the academia, we work closely with the Trapka, and uh, to train our, our, our people. Impact of these efforts, we see competitiveness of our nation. When you look at the rank of doing business, our East, East Africa is not bad. But if we, we benchmark like a country who is doing well, we can be on a level of Japan. This is the study of the World Bank, they told us if every country benchmark where another country is, is the best, we can be ranked like Japan. We need prosperity, issue, development, and reduction of poverty. This, in this time, media was talking about that impact of this implementation. Because every, everything maybe is tested in East Africa. East Africa became an incubator of uh, uh, technologies and the trade facilitation. For example, East African newspaper said for Rwanda, the electronic single window saw a clearance times for, uh, from 11 days to 10 hours, saving business 6.8 million in 2013 alone. Uganda Revenue Authority electronic cargo tracking customs management system saw 70% reduction in the transit and clearance time saving trade uh, 57 million annually. Another, uh, East African single custom territory also improved the transit time to major cities from uh, the, uh, the ports, reducing time and trade costs and improving competitiveness. Uh, our time release study we made we, in Dar es Salaam and the Central Corridor and, uh, and uh, the Northern Corridor used to use 24 hours to, to transport goods from Mombasa to Kampala. 24 days. Now is four days. From Dar es Salaam to Kigali is four days. We have challenges. We see when I was visiting the borders last week, uh, I say there is a problem of mindset. People, they want to do as they use it to do. Like clearing. We have a window of pre-clearance of goods before they arrive. You can use a photocopy. You can, but the clearing guardians, they are don't embrace. Even the customs, they are at the same level. We need change mindset, awareness, and the capacity building of the people, too. Because they were claiming... Uh, to expand the parking. And I told them, uh, no donor will come to expand the parking. Even this one is enough. Even you should see what to use. You should not stop good here. You should clear the good they go, where they are destined. There are other border agents. Uh, customs is in advance in using the modern instrument, but there are other agencies which are still lagging behind. We want to, to try to, to help them to join. There is also a problem of funding. Uh, this program of trade facilitation, national plans were developed in East Africa, uh, regional plans were also, project proposal, and also uh, we had a donor round table in 2017. They, direct, they suggested that we can develop a, we develop a concept paper. That concept paper was uh, developed and adopted. Now we are at the point of calling uh, the potential donors to come to join hands and develop. Also, we see a problem of sustainability. All these projects, good projects, are, are donor-driven. 
The maintenance will be an issue when they hand over to the government. The government maybe tomorrow will present, we have a ministerial retreat, we try to convince the policymakers that is the time, next budget cycle, to try to put some funds to maintain this good infrastructure which we got from donors. Thank you very much for yeah. your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ivaristo, also for concluding with the reference to our meeting tomorrow. Uh, you, you started out uh, highlighting the successes and the advances that uh, EAC has made, and, and we are very proud, of course, to be associated with this, be it ASICUDA, the corridors, the trade portals, the e-readiness assessments, the NTFC work, uh, and, and yesterday's workshop we were together with the GIZ. But you are not sleeping on your laurels. You are not saying we are the best REC in Africa with uh, doing business. No, we want to, to continue to improve, and, and I think our work tomorrow will be very much in, in this direction. Thank you very much. Uh, as warned before, we have time really now for one question. I would be happy to give it to the gentleman whom I had to cut off before, if you have a question to this panel. Otherwise, I would open the floor. <laughs> and kindly introduce yourself. Uh, my question uh, will address it to, me, to Mr. Frederick and Vanessa. Uh, what measures have been taken to address uh, rural physical rural physical addressing and if they be willing to or they be willing or open to solutions. Uh, thank you for this question. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the UPU is uh, offering addressing assistance uh, based on a standard that was developed uh, at the UPU uh, called S42. And this standard has been or has been integrated with what uh, was approved in the last Congress, uh, which is supporting geo-coding and geo-location uh, uh, addressing. Uh, those should be able to support the addressing in rural areas. But ultimately, the drive is national. The UPU provides assistance, technical assistance. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, Kenya uh, has launched um, certain initiative uh, through a tender that was floated, uh, I think, uh, one month ago. And the UPU will support uh, Kenya in, in this kind of things. And also South Africa did the same thing. So, uh, but the country has to take the leading role, and we are integrating what we have as a, as a UPU standard with what uh, is a modern uh, trend in, term, in terms of mobile technology and geolocation addressing. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I would like us to give a big applause to those on the... You wanted to answer to that question as well? If I may. Please, um, the moderator so, gives you the floor. Thank you. So just very, very briefly, I think as far as um, accessing and servicing rural areas, we, as DHL, for instance, we largely take the lead from the local postal authority because that really speaks to their mandates. And, and Frederick made the point is that it's a constitutional right um, to have access to postal services. Um, DHL does dabble in, in investigating new um, and emerging technologies, uh, one of which, or, or concept, um, is what three words, which is very topical at the moment. Um, but, but that's literally been trialled through our innovation centre in Germany to determine its applicability. The, the difficult part of this conversation is to say that as a as a as a private company, for want of a better term, um, where we make investments is largely d driven by customer demand. And at the moment, the, the present situation is that the demand for service, as far as all, uh, just about every delivery, and specifically e-commerce, is from your urban areas. So whilst we have a really extensive geographical footprint, um, it's there to it's there to support. Um, the existing business in anticipation of growth going forward. Um, it certainly doesn't prescribe that that footprint won't grow um, in response to local demand. 
Okay, no, thank you for this compliment. So we still have four more highlights to come from the freight forwarders, private sector, trademark, and, and can trade. Let us give one big round of applause to the first six panelists. <laughs> and I will now have to throw you out of this uh, and, and uh, vacant your seats for our four friends who have patiently waited in the front line.